Let me tell you about our, our speaker coming up. I met her a little over a year ago when we were at the same conference and we were walking from point A to point B and having one of those conversations, tell me about yourself. And as she started to speak, I went, oh my goodness, I have got to get you in front of this group. How many of us see things that aren't right and we say, somebody needs to do something? Or we see an issue that we want to help address, but what can one person here in Boise, Idaho do about that? Nancy Hughes, at age 59 and living in Eugene, Oregon, was looking for something to do with herself after her husband died in 2001. So she volunteered with a medical team going to Guatemala. Now, Nancy didn't have a medical background, but she'd raised a family, and so she said, well, I can cook for you. And I'm gonna let her tell you her story from there, but the bottom line is this. Nancy Hughes saw a need and took a single step after single step to bring about change. Today, her Stove Team International Organization has produced more than 71,000 stoves, improving the lives of more than a half a million people in Mexico and Central America. I give you a one woman, change the world kind of person, Nancy Hughes. Well, I really want to show you a video first so you know sort of what we're doing because the issue that we're addressing is something most people don't know anything about. So let's, let's see the video. They make this world black. My hands were like grease. You couldn't wash it away. Pots were black, the air was black. It was impossible for breathing. We have seen forest reserves in three years completely gone, not a single tree standing there. Three billion people use biomass, so wood, dung, charcoal, agricultural waste, and they cook those on very rudimentary open fires. That smoke kills roughly two million people each year, mostly women and children. So that's double the number of people that die from malaria each year. The most dangerous activity a woman in the developing world can undertake is cooking for her family. And most of them have a baby on the front or a baby on the back, so that baby is inhaling so much smoke it's equivalent to three packs of cigarettes a day. Cooking on an open fire contributes more black carbon to the atmosphere than all of the cars and the trucks in the world combined. To make a ton of charcoal it takes about 10 ton of trees. The forests are just vanishing. production and distribution of ultra-clean cookstoves that nearly completely eliminate smoke and reduce fuel consumption. This new stove, look at this with your eyes. There is less smoke and it uses much less fuel. The black is gone. I feel healthier and my children they are no longer sick. What's the best way to design a stove to reduce smoke and increase performance? Our goal is to really bring 
researchers, designers, engineers, business people together. So it takes all of these people, all under one umbrella, to get the right stove into the hands of women. Normally a stove fire, you go down there, it's totally screwed up, the design doesn't work, it uses more than the open fire. I mean, it's just like a thousand things go wrong. We're, you know, mentally prepared for corruption. So stuff's going to get just lost, held up, arrive, broken. I reckon everything that can go wrong will go wrong. The scale is huge. We need to make not just 100 million stoves by 2020, but we have to serve 100 million families. To really serve 100 million families, more like 300 million stoves. I mean, this is off the chart. By manufacturing cook stoves, we're going to save thousands of lives more than a hundred million trees. We're going to create local viable jobs and we're going to reduce indoor air pollution for millions of women. It's an incredible opportunity. We hope you join us. So like you, <laughs> like you, I didn't know this was an issue. It's like, what? This is killing people? How come we haven't heard about it? So anyway, um, I didn't set out to do this. You know, I'm 76. I didn't, as a grandmother, it's like, what am I doing? Anyway, um, but I'll tell you about my journey because maybe it'll help you think about things you can do. So in 2001, as Tracy told you, my husband died of breast cancer. He was a family practice physician. Uh, my children were at that point out of the house. My husband was gone and I had to figure out something to do. So my husband had been a Rotarian and shortly before his, his death, Rotary began accepting women. You know, I remember there were a couple of guys who quit the club. I was like, what are we, what are we doing with women here? Anyway, uh, so, so his club asked me to join. And I was a very reluctant Rotarian. I thought it was old men who played golf, you know, whatever. Anyway, but I wanted something meaningful to occupy my time. And my son was dating this young woman, Melanie. And Melanie was going on a medical team with her mom, who was a nurse. And Mel Melanie was a student, you know, and I was like, how can you go with this medical team? And she said, well, they need people. You know, you can sign up. I mean, there are people that help. And so I signed up. And then they said, what can you do? And I was like, oh, what can I do? Mm. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a mom. And they said, OK, we'll put you in the kitchen. And I thought, yeah, right, OK, well, whatever. So. Um, <laughs> Anyway, in 2003, I flew to Guatemala City. And to give you an idea, I mean, they weren't real organized at this point, And you know, I didn't know what I was doing. So we, we flew on a night flight. I don't do that anymore. Anyway, we, we flew on a night flight. We arrived in Guatemala City. And then we had a meeting at some time like midnight. Then we got up at 5, and we drove 15 hours north to the border of Guatemala and Mexico. We drove to a place called Playa Grande. Some of you speak Spanish. There was no playa, and it wasn't grande. <laughs> so anyway, uh, there we were. There we were in this former military base. Now, some of you know, and many of you don't, there was a 30-year war going on in Guatemala that the US had some complicity in. But anyway, so people were terrified of coming to this uh, military base. So we had a volunteer with a Mickey Mouse hat on who brought people in. And you know, I mean, who can be afraid of that? So anyway, um, th there had been no, uh, well, one little incident I can tell you is how did people know we were there? I mean, how did they know? So it sounds random, but they hired a guy on a motorcycle with a megaphone to go around saying, free medical care, free medical care. So people came. To give you an idea, there was no there still is no medical care for the indigenous population. These people were indigenous Mayan folks who had gone across the border to Mexico because of the war. And so they were coming back into Guatemala. The first case that really impressed me, the first case that I saw, was a young man. He was probably 15 years old. He came in with a wooden chair strapped to his back with his sister in it. He had walked 
over the mountains of Guatemala. There are 26 volcanoes there. He'd walked over the mountains of Guatemala for three days with his sister. She had a ruptured appendix. That's the, that's the situation as far as medical care down there. So, you know, when you work with a medical team down there, you can see what's going on. People think my husband had something to do with my going, but he didn't. He didn't at all. You know, I just was curious. And you know, in the US, you can't just walk into a hospital and say, oh, you're taking out a tumor. Uh, what does that look like? So <laughs> anyway, but down there, you can. But down there, you can. You just had to stay a certain number of, you know, to a certain distance away from the, the surgery that was going on. So I saw all kinds of horrifying things. I mean, I did see somebody remove a tumor about that big from somebody's insides. and. Um, I saw babies where they couldn't intubate them. They couldn't put the little tubes down their throats because their throats were so choked with creosote, they couldn't put the tubes down and save their lives. That's the first time I ever saw a dead baby. It was not fun at all. So anyway, I, I thought I was, you know, I was working really hard. I mean, those surgeons don't know when to quit. Uh, you know, we were having to cook for them from six in the morning until midnight. And, you know, and then I slept on a cot in the kitchen. It was crazy. But I thought, wow, this is important. I need to come back. So for three years, I came back for, for 10 days every year for three years. And on the third year, this young woman named Irma, who was probably the age of many of you, probably about 18, came into the kitchen. She didn't speak, <laughs> she didn't speak Spanish. I didn't speak Spanish. She was an indigenous Mayan. She spoke Quechiquel. I didn't speak Quechiquel. I didn't speak Spanish. So we had to have double interpreters. And she said, uh, I fell into an open fire at the age of two, and my hands have been burned shut for 16 years and your team has opened my hands, and I want to thank the team. I was like, my goodness, of course we can delay dinner so you can thank the team. So she did that, and she stood up in front of the team and explained you know, what had happened to her, and everybody cried. It was amazing. Anyway, so I just thought, well, that's just the stupidest thing I ever heard of. People are cooking inside their house on an open campfire? We should do something about that. So I went back to my Rotary Club and I said, well, don't you do things about that? And, don't <laughs> and Dick Briggs looked at me straight in the eye and he said, yeah, we do. You have to write a grant. I said, well, I've never written a grant. He said, well, I'll help you. So we wrote a grant. And I said, well, how much do we write it for? And he said, well, what do you think you can get? I said, I don't know. I just need to tell people what's going on down there. And, he, and I said, what happens if you write it for the max and you don't get it? And he said, well, you get what you get. I was like, OK, this works for me. Let's write it for the max. <laughs> so we did. Anyway, um, so we wrote the first grant for $56,000, which was the maximum you could write it for at that time without having to go through audits and all that kind of nonsense. Anyway, when people, when people found out what was going on, they donated. And I was like, cool. So we took, uh, I went to my Rotary Club again, and I said, I'm, you know, I'm going to go to Guatemala, and I'm going to be part of this medical team, and does anybody want to go with me? Uh, we raised enough money to put in a number of stoves. And so, you know, people in my club aren't real swift, so, so they signed up. Anyway, um, so, we, so we went down there, and uh, with that team, we put in the existing fuel-efficient cook stoves, which I had learned about. And I can remember the first time reading this flyer from, from the Cascade Medical Team talking about stoves, I thought, what? The stoves have to do with health. But anyway, so, so we put in about 120 stoves. They were made out of 300 pound pieces of cement. Those stoves are still made and they're very good. But you know, have you ever met any Guatemalans? Most of them are this tall. And there are all these volcanoes, and they live on the sides of volcanoes. So they had to haul all the pieces of the stoves up the sides of the volcanoes. And I was like, hmm, well, we're putting in 120 stoves. So I, I did a little research, and I found out 
that the need in Guatemala alone was for six million cook stoves. So we weren't doing enough. So I was like, I think I'll stop. But I, you know, I didn't know that the leading designer of what we call rocket elbow cook stoves lived 20 minutes from me in Philomath, Oregon. So Larry, you got to picture Larry. He's about this big around. His shirt doesn't quite button in the front, you know, and he's got like three cars taken apart in his front yard. <laughs> you know these people, right? <laughs> anyway, Larry came to my door with his, kin, with his friend Ken, and he knocked on my door, and Ken came in and gave me this little booklet. You've probably seen it called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And he said, you can't quit. This is really important. This is a problem in the world, Nancy. You have to do something about it. And I was like, uh, no, I, I'm, you know, I'm 60. I'm not, stop, I'm not doing this any longer. And he said, no, no, you need to keep going. What's the problem? And I said, well, the problem is the stoves are too heavy. They're annoying because you have to carry them up these volcanoes to put them into houses. Sometimes the houses aren't big enough to get the stupid stove in there. And, you know, so he said, so, so, you know, I didn't know who he was. And he said, so what do you want? And I said, well, I, you know, I was really cheeky. I said, well, I want a portable stove. I want it made locally. I mean, this is the reason people are poor is because they don't have any jobs. So I, you know, I want to supply jobs down there. And, you know, I want it to, made up, to be made out of all biodegradable materials. You know, I was blah, 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 <laughs> you know, so, okay. And so he said, well, don't worry about it. I'm going to a stove, I mean, who knew there were stove conferences? Anyway. <laughs> He said, I'm going to a stove conference in Nicaragua, and I'll design a stove for you, and I'll find somebody to make them. And I thought, right, you know, have a nice life, goodbye. <laughs> and I, you know, I went out and bought golf clubs. I mean, I kid you not. <laughs> they have never been used. I have brand new golf clubs at my house. Anyway, so, um, so anyway, uh, off he went, and I... I thought about taking golf lessons. But I'd been, you know, publicizing the plight of indoor cooking fires for some time. What I didn't know is that the leading cause of death of children under five in the world is smoke from indoor cooking fires. I had thought it was all about burns. But anyway, so there you go. When a, you know, you heard on the video, when a baby's on the front or a baby's on the back and the mom's leaning over an open fire, that's equivalent to that baby smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. I mean, it's just horrifying. So anyway, um, I, I thought about, you know, what can I do with this? Well, I don't know if you, feel, if you believe in faith or karma or fairies in the sky or whatever, but you know, I'd been publicizing this problem and Larry had said, you know, I'm down in, in uh, at that point he, was in, he gave me a call and he was in El Salvador and I said, what are you doing in El Salvador? He says, well, we've designed a stove for you and we've, you know, I found somebody who wants to produce them. And he said, you just have to pay this guy $500 a month until you can get down here. I was like, I am not paying some random guy in El Salvador $500 a month. You know, that doesn't make any sense. And he said, well, then you better get down here. <laughs> okay, so again, you know, I, I, uh, I thought, what am I, gonna, what am I gonna do? So again, I don't know what you believe in, but Monday, Larry said, well, think about it, think about it, Nancy, and I'll give you until Monday, okay? So Monday, I went to the mailbox. I got a check from Carlos Santana, the guitarist, for $10,000 for stoves for the developing world. And, you know, I thought about giving it back, but then I thought about Irma, and I thought about the problems that were down there, and I thought, well, I guess I, guess I gotta keep going. And so, again, you know, I go to my Rotary Club, and I say, okay, I am going to El Salvador. I've never been there before, and we're gonna meet this guy who's made a stove, and uh, other than that, I don't know what we're gonna do, but we're gonna go for a week, and as I said, the people in my club aren't too bright, so three people signed up. <laughs> So, so anyway, we went down, we went down there, 
uh, arrived at the airport and there was Larry and there was a man named Gustavo Pena and he had his Excel spreadsheet for our appointments for the week, starting with the Vice Minister of the Environment. I had not seen the stove. Okay, off we go. So we went to the Ministry of Environment, show our passports, you know, do all the rigmarole. And we get in there and Larry stands up in the front and he has a whiteboard and he's explaining how the, how the stove works and what it is. And so he says, it's basically molded in a bucket of, uh, into a bucket of cement. It's molded upside down like this. The mold, the cement is poured in. And it's just three quarters of an inch thick. So it's not all of this. It's the cement piece is like a big bucket. And then in the center is the combustion chamber made of what we call baldosa and what you probably call Mexican roofing tile. You know those orange tiles that you see. So that's the combustion chamber. It's in the form of an elbow. You start this, the fire here. So you've got heat way at the, you've got the heat way at the back. But what you want to do to create complete combustion and have no smoke is you want to mix hot air and cold air. So you use this little device, which we call the portalena, which translated means the wood holder upper. You put the wood in up here. That pull with the heat from, from back in the center pulls the cold air in. It's the same as the grate you have in your fireplace. That's what it's for in case you were like me and didn't know what it was for. It, anyway, so it pulls the, the heat and the, and the cold air into the back and you create complete combustion, no smoke. You have smoke when you start the fire because they use uh, what we call fire starters, what they call okote, which is pitch pine to start the fire. So then in between that bucket and the combustion chamber, I do this all the time. Anyway, <laughs> in between is uh, insulation. Of course, remember those volcanoes? It's pumice. So pumice keeps it cool on the, on the exterior and hot on the interior. Then we just have two pieces of metal. This holds up the pot for cooking rice and beans. You know, this is all fake, just in case you thought I was macho mama up here. <laughs> anyway, um, so this is what we call the plancha or comal for cooking your tortillas. And that goes on the, on the top and it's uh, the spacing. It looks kind of random, but the spacing is actually just one quarter inch up, so the, the heat comes out and spreads evenly for cooking your tortillas. And we found at the beginning that it didn't, that it was hotter, it burned the center tortilla. And there was a lady there who was uh, stepping on a tin can and putting it over the center. And we thought, well, we can take care of that. And so we now weld an extra piece onto the center so that it's all evenly cooking. So we show this to the Minister of the Environment, how it works, and he says, well, let's see the stove. So they drag it in from the back of this ratty car that we were running around in and put it up in the backyard of the Ministry of Environment. We lit the fire. The Vice Minister brought in a liter pot of water, boiled a liter of water in under eight minutes, same as your microwave, the heat came out of the center at 1,000 degrees, so it was the same as a microwave, and there was no smoke except for when you started the fire. So the vice minister looks at us and he says, well, I like it. Uh, it looks a little bit like a toilet, but I think it'll, I think it'll be accepted. Um, what do you think? Do you have, do you, I, we have about five and a half million dollars for a project like yours. What's your capacity? I mean, what's our capacity? Two stoves. <laughs> so anyway, we went, we went back. We went back to this cheesy little hotel where we were staying for $25 a night. You know, I mean, we're not rich people. So we, we went back, and I can remember standing out in the parking lot and these Rotarians with me, and they're going, you can do it, Nancy. You can open a factory in El Salvador. <laughs> 
Lord help me, no way. So anyway, so we have one smart Rotarian and he looked at me and he said, listen, he said, listen, we've got a great product. We have incredible need. We've got a guy that wants to produce this, this product. So why don't we go back and, you know, try raising money and, and see what we can get and place an order with him for a thousand cook stoves and see what he does with it. Okay, I mean, that worked for me. So okay, so I went back and I started giving these silly speeches and, and, and people donated. And so, okay, so we, we raised enough money through a Rotary grant, which doubled and tripled the, the amount that we raised. And uh, we, we raised enough money to place an order with Gustavo Pena for a thousand cook stoves. The idea was he sold, we pre-ordered them, prepaid them, but he sold them. Then he collected the money from the sale and he put it into a bank account that we controlled until all thousand stoves had been sold. And then he retained that money, which was probably enough for three months more of capacity for the factory um, to keep going. And we wouldn't have to, and the whole idea was we didn't have to do it, right? We just had to raise a little money. So we did that. And in the first year, he sold 1,400 stoves. Okay, all right. So I thought, look at us, aren't we cool? <laughs> but now we can quit. But that didn't happen. <laughs> So then I got a call from a guy that I had worked with in Guatemala, and he says, my friend Marco wants to start a factory. Do you want to help him? And I'm like, hmm, well, I called my brother, who was a Rotarian down in Irvine, California. I says, your club want to raise money for, you know, for starting a factory in, in Guatemala? And he said, sure. I was like, okay, right, all right. So we, anyway, so we brought Marco uh, we brought uh, Gustavo up from El Salvador, and he trained Marco how to start a factory there. Well, then I thought we were done, but again, we weren't done. So I was, I, you guys don't understand this because it's lovely weather here, but I was escaping the rain in Oregon, and so I was running around Central America in the winter, and I had an intern from Oregon State University with me. Um, and and so so we were running around down down there and we decided to go to Honduras and see if they, you know, see if they needed stoves over there. So we're driving around. We were in Tegucigalpa and it was miserable. And I said, I, you know, I don't know, some of you've probably been there. It's all one-way streets that have no names. So it's really sort of terrifying. Anyway, and I said, listen, since we don't have an agenda, I've always wanted to see the ruins in, in uh, Copan. So let's go to Copan Ruinas. No, not having any idea that it was seven hours away, but whatever. So we went to Copan Ruinas and Ian's with me. And Ian says, well, I've never been to Honduras so I need to get a flag. Uh, let's go to this hardware store and I'll buy a flag. And I said, no, I just need a licuado, a smoothie. And, and so we go into this hardware store and by that time, you know, we have these shirts that say Stove Team International and Ian's in there and the guy in the, in the shop says, what's this thing about stoves? We need stoves here. And I'm like, I need a smoothie. <laughs> And he says, you need to talk to our Rotary Club. I said, where do I get the smoothie? And he said, okay, across, the Liquedo place is across the street. So I went across the street and I sat down fat and happy and this woman comes up to me and she says, hi, my name is Reina and I'm from the Rotary Club of Copan Ruinas and we need stoves. As I said, this is not my fault. I mean, I just was there. So anyway, so then the next thing we did was we brought Marco over from Guatemala. You know, these places are all like five hours drive apart, so it's easy. So we brought, brought him over uh, to meet with Anibal Murcia, and Anibal started a factory there. And then, you know, then the next year we got this call from Wenatchee, Washington, and they wanted to, they'd been working in Nicaragua for some time and wanted to have a stove factory there. So, you know, so there we were. We started another factory in, in Nicaragua. So, you know, I didn't, I, I really didn't set out to do this. I mean, you know, it was crazy. Anyway, um, but I just thought I'd tell you some of the results. So, um, Marco employs 22 people and has established a free school for 80 children. 
Gustavo earned enough money to send his son to orthodonture school. He's now a practicing orthodontist. Anibal, despite the economic problems in Honduras, purchased property to expand his stove um, district, uh, his stove business. So, you know, I didn't have any training. I didn't know what I was doing. I just kind of wanted to help this young woman. And so you heard the results. We've put out, we, not I, have put out 72,000 stoves impacting the lives of about half a million individuals. Wow. Thank you. So evidently, evidently, I didn't talk enough, so you guys have to ask me questions. <laughs> Tracy's coming up to organize me. Thanks, Nancy. It, it, it's remarkable. So many of us say, we just, what can we do from here? And the answer is show up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. Those of you who have questions, write them down. Put the question cards up in the air. Our volunteers will come and pick them up. So what would you say, show up is a pretty good start. What would you say for somebody here in Boise, Idaho, who sees something that they want to make a difference on? Well, it's the same thing I did. You just put one foot in front of the other. You just say, oh, hmm, you, you need help? Let me help you. You know, I mean, I didn't have any training. I didn't have any grand plan. I, I basically, I hate to say it, but I basically just showed up and things happened. I was interviewed in Mexico uh, and this gentleman who was from Guatemala said, well, thank you so much for helping my country, but um, you said that you feel like somebody's dropping angels in front of you. And I said, yeah, I feel like somebody's dropping angels in front of me because I didn't know what I was doing. And he said, well, let me, let me tell you at the, at the end of this interview about the angels, because I know them. I was like, you know the angels. Anyway, he says, yeah, my grandmother died from smoke from indoor cooking fires, and she's up there with her friends dropping angels. Wow. How much does a stove cost? The stoves cost about $50. Yeah, it's 50 US. I have to be careful when I'm saying that. I was talking in Canada, and I realized that's different over there. So, <laughs> so do you have a presence? That's great, thanks. Do you have a presence uh, outside of South America? Central America is the only place we work. Uh, we've been asked to work all over the world, but um, every Every area cooks differently, and a stove has to be designed for the specific uh, way that you cook. For instance, not everybody cooks flat breads, but this was designed, designed for that. Yeah, I want to clarify about the cost of the stove. When people buy the stove, almost every stove in Central America has to be subsidized in some way. So th we get it down to $10, and they pay $10, and then um, we subsidize the rest by Churches do that, Rotary Clubs do that, various organizations, yeah. Uh, I think you've already got some people in the audience who are ready to go on your next trip down there, so. It's can already you, full. Can, <laughs> can, you talk, can you talk about your organization and what you're doing? Yeah, well, I told these guys I'm, I'm leaving right after this and going down to Central America, but we take volunteer trips, we take at least four a year. Uh, the youngest person is eight, the oldest is, well, I used to say 80, but Costa Columbus is coming back us this time, and I think he's 84. But anyway, and, and we take one-on-one -on -one Spanish instruction in the morning, and then we make stoves, deliver stoves, or test stoves every afternoon, and it's $1,600 plus your airfare for 10 days. Yeah. And so people can just find you on it your website? Could, people can find us on our website. We have, uh, the October trip is full. January trip has one space, the March trip is open, so we, we can take up to 20 in March. And that's Stove Team International. Yeah. Um, are you a United Way um, entity? Can they donate to you through United Way? That I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, and are the stoves, the, the $50 for the stoves, can, can these indigenous people, can they afford that? Or they, is can afford, uh, they can afford $10. And so we, it, the rest of it has to be subsidized. Okay. Well, in, 
99% of the cases, yeah. They, they live on one to two dollars a day. And if you haven't seen it, there's a fabulous video done by two guys from Claremont McKenna College called Living on One. That's worth watching, and it's, those are the people we deal with. So how do you bridge the gap between the need for stoves and the production limits? There's plenty of room for it to increase production. Yeah, no problem. Any, uh, well, here's, so are, do you have plans, this is another one, expanding outside of, of Central America or? or it's, it, we don't. There are many organizations you saw in the video dealing with, dealing with stoves throughout the world. There's some wonderful ones in, there's a wonderful organization in Kenya. And, you know, one of the issues is we always get a request to work in Haiti, but that's a different stove because they cook with charcoal and we discourage the use of charcoal. So how much does one of these things weigh? They weigh now about 60 to 70 pounds. They used to be lighter weight, but we had to make the decision between the weight and the portability. And what we found is the reality is that we want it to be as sturdy as possible. And usually people put it in one place and never move it, so. So um, another person who is, who is amazed at your story and, and wanting, but saying, you know, somewhere along the way, there had to be adversity. So oh, as, yeah. as lessons to learn, what's the biggest obstacle that jumped out in front of you and how did you, how did you go over well, it? Well, the biggest obstacle is money. So how did I go over it? I came to talk to you guys. <laughs> um, I mean, you can go to our website and donate. So, so have you always been an activist? Yeah. How did, how did you spend your time and energy before your husband's passing? Oh, good Lord. Um, well, I had three children and two exchange students living with me always. And so, you know, how did I spend my energy? Some of you have children. I mean, come on. <laughs> I, I think one person wants to, uh, to, to get one of those stoves to use here in Boise. Would they work in our climate? They would work, but we don't make them here. They're only made in Latin America. So that's, I mean... That's the issue. I've had people ask, you know, can I ship one up? Yeah, if you got somebody to go to customs with you and somebody to receive it at the airport and go to customs with you and, you know, pay all the whatever. I don't know. I mean, just this styrofoam thing went through inspection at two airports. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the big question, and it's a great question to end on. What's next for you? Retirement. <laughs> You didn't hear me say that. No, we have a wonderful staff of three, and I keep trying to step back, and then, you know, then I can't, but whatever. No, I want to keep doing this as long as I can, and as far as the organization, you know, we're doing some educational stuff now. A uh, wonderful woman, Kathy Degendorfer, has made a coloring book. We're going into schools. We've developed an institutional stove so that that goes into a school, so the people that are cooking in the schools, then are using a fuel efficient cook stove, and then there's a discount for any of the moms who want to buy stoves for their homes. So that's our, that's our next big push. Well, you are truly an inspiration, and thank you for sharing your story with us. <laughs> <laughs>